ultimately a, a firm that had several ties to the leaders that you just mentioned uh, is really at the center of the investigation, is AEG. What can you tell us about AEG and Carl O'Farrell? AEG is what? And Carl O'Farrell? Well, Carl O'Farrell was involved originally with an organization called Capital Play. And uh, he had loads of problems with regard to uh, um, his involvement in Australia. He was uh, disqualified from a contract there. He resigned in lieu of the contract being revoked. And it was clear that as long as he had some uh, connection with uh, AEG, which won the contract, that um, AEG would not be licensed and was not licensable. Despite that, uh, the... Um, That's uh, all it took? Just that Carlo Farrell's, um, uh, his involvement in AEG? Well, it was not just O'Farrell. There was O'Farrell, there were some others, there were people who had uh, criminal convictions. Uh, there were many, many issues besides licensability. They didn't have the money. They had would have had to go into debt financing to raise the money. They would have had to delay construction for over a year in order to comply with the environmental uh, issues. Um, they had um, Samson, who was championing them, so they had a, a very good uh, a program on minority and women participation, but they were no better than anyone else. As a matter of fact, the, the bidder whom they, um, they eliminated and who should have been selected at day one, uh, win, um, had as good if not a, a superior program on uh, minority and women participation. There was no legitimate non-political reason for uh, AEG to have survived beyond September of 2009. Uh, did you happen to find out what the relationship was between John Sampson and the people in, in charge of AEG, what the nature of that relationship is? Well, we know what the, the, the talent of AEG was having such wonderful lobbyists who were able to get uh, leaked information concerning all of the competitors um, what lobbying uh, firms are we talking about? I'm sorry? The lobbying firms? They had, um, they had everybody. Hank Shankoff was a key lobbyist. He took the uh, claimant's privilege against self-incrimination when we examined him. Um, Carl Andrews was another uh, key lobbyist, a former state senator. And uh, he is litigated to prevent us from uh, examining him as a witness. Matter of fact, that litigation continued today in New York where he's, uh, he's appealing a decision by a state Supreme Court judge saying that uh, we had the right to question him. And I uh, stated at the press conference, I say it now, no matter how long it takes, we're going to get Carl Andrews down as a witness. Uh, the, let's just, would you say uh, that everyone that, that you've noted, uh, all of the elected leaders were equally culpable, or was, for example, a Samson uh, more culpable than a Silver? One person's transgression could not have been possible without the acquiescence of another. So, for example, when the leaders met on September 23rd, and it was clear based upon the professional uh, analyses that were done by the budget by lottery and by others, it was clear that AEG was a problem and should, uh, with a problem with licensability and every other issue. Uh, the leaders uh, met, they were aware of these problems, they had been briefed, they knew that um, Wynn had been the recommended, preferred uh, bidder by all of the professionals, and at that point, Samson uh, asked uh, the governor's council, Kiernan, to give AEG additional time to establish their licensability. Why? AEG had nothing to recommend it. They had a much better bidder. That should have been the end of the process. A AEG should have been eliminated, when should have been selected, billions of dollars would have been uh, saved, and this exercise in futility and this enormous waste uh, could, have been, could have been avoided. And what, what's interesting is that when this whole uh, fiasco ended, 
with the elimination finally of AEG because they couldn't get the money. After they're selected, they discover that they didn't have the money, that they could not meet other requirements. Um, and the, they started again, and they, uh, they did select somebody within four months uh, the way they should have been done it, the way it should have been done the first time. Again, think with just the regular process. Yes, the regular procurement thing. Now, you, you, you keep in mind the statute that was passed, really the root cause of all of this, was this, this monstrous statute that was passed in 2008, and that was the creature of Governor Spitzer, of Senator Bruno, and of Speaker uh, uh, Silver. That uh, vested in the three leaders, the so-called three men in the room, uh, the power, the exclusive power, to select a, a bidder, a, a, a licensee for Aqueduct. This was an enormous uh, license, a uh, franchise. It was 30 years with an opportunity for a 10-year extension. As far as we discovered, this was probably the most lucrative revenue contract in the history of the state. What was the statute called? It was the, uh, it was the laws of 19, it was the, uh, laws of 1988, uh, chapter 12 or chapter 18, chapter, chapter 18, 18 of the laws of 19 of 2008. And that's, that statute, what that meant, uh, this was a revenue contract. What this meant was that there's no competitive bidding, the restrictions on lobbying would, did not apply. That's correct. And the restrictions on campaign contributions did not apply. So you had you lobbying, you had lobbying um, all over the place. Uh, AEG, spent about a half a million dollars just on their lobbies, lobbyists. I had described that scene as like a plague of locusts. Uh, the lobbyists descended upon everybody who had any role, conceivable role, in the selection process. So not only the three leaders, but people who were impacted, uh, the assemblyman from, the, from Queens, the state senator from Queens, the chairman of the community board, the the uh, lobbyist, the, as one of the participants uh, said, they were all over the place. Right? So they were that, the ammunition of uh, AEG were the lobbyists, the, lo the, the um, ammunition of the lobbyists was that they were able to get um, confidential informa information that was leaked to them. Yeah. And they had all of the uh, inside information about their competitors. They were able to knock their competitors. They were able to, to um, meet the, uh, the um, um, offers that competitors had, been, had submitted. Judge, why did AEG, or why did the lobbyists, um, why did Samson uh, give preferential treatment to these lobbyists? I mean, what were they giving him? Well, he, uh, it's interesting information that we un uncovered. When it became clear after the so-called coup in June of 2009, when Malcolm Smith is deposed, he retains his, his title, but Samson is the, is the, uh, the leader and the one of the three decision makers representing the Senate. Uh, at that point, we discovered a very interesting uh, memo uh, from the uh, AEG people. Uh, they called it the Brooklyn Buy-In. And they said that what's going on behind the scenes is that um, because Samson now is the uh, Brooklyn, uh, Brooklyn person, and because he is the, uh, has replaced Smith, the Queens person, Brooklyn wants to be uh, able to satisfy their constituents as well. So there was going to be some lucre for There's jobs. Something for Samson, and he said he had to satisfy uh, the, the Brooklyn constituents. So there's also an interesting email where um, it said that a certain senator has insisted that they engage somebody, all right? And that uh, a certain senator, they reluctantly identified as Samson, and the person that um, he wanted to engage was this, this person, Cogsville, and um, they regarded this as essential because now uh, Smith is no longer the decision maker, but Samson is. 
Queens. Queens is not the per not the community they have to satisfy, but Brooklyn may have satisfied both communities. So that was Brooklyn buy-in. It was called the Brooklyn buy-in. I think that's what it was actually uh, described in the memo. The Brooklyn buy-in. So there's not even an, an artifice. There's no pretend. And it, we discovered uh, emails um, that were devastating, and it's all in the report, the leaks. And when Samson uh, fought us tooth and nail to keep us from trying unsuccessfully, keep us from getting uh, information concerning how they uh, uh, evaluated all the bids, what their decisions were, and why they decided a certain way, he uh, fought us and claimed that this information was confidential. The same information which he went to court to stop us from getting, um, he turned over to Carl Andrews and emailed, yes, he leaked that to Andrews and um, some of the emails uh, clearly belie his statement that these, that these things were not confidential because in one email it says this is what we got, this based upon the leaked information we're in good shape. Another one says uh, this is confidential. Another one says don't just don't keep this deleted. All right. So you, did you see his? Uh, we have the emails. We obtained the emails. They're in the report. Okay. We got an email today <laughs> that was very public about his reaction to your report. Good. What did he say? Um, he said that well, this has been an inconsistent. The only consistency here has been the inconsistent way in which uh, the, the bidding has been uh, judged, the, the, uh, how this has gone about for nine years. So we, we you know, everybody made a big boo-boo for nine years, and now we're going to do uh, an internal investigation. Well, you would think that somebody who occupies such an exalted uh, position of power and authority um, should have known this. There was nothing here that required uh, Albert Einstein uh, a mentality here. This stuff was, uh, was so obvious as to what uh, had to be done. Look, you have professionals who evaluated all the bids. You had the budget who was interested, obviously, in money. The state is hemorrhaging for money. Budget says Wynn Win had a portfolio of billions. He was able to do it. Bid so budget and lottery said Wynn is the in. The budget lobbery, the uh, assistant counsel to, to the uh, so the governor rose, they had a memo, they said uh, Wynn and then S.L. Green, don't bother with the other four. They said that AEG is not licensable. They said Peebles, that was another of the six, is not licensable. And yet, uh, at that meeting in September, um, Kieran waits outside, he's called in, and Samson says, give AEG some more time to prove their licensability. Why? And there was no Why? reason for that. How much money do you estimate they wasted? Well, we know, we know that um, uh, uh, half a million dollars was spent uh, by AEG on lobbyists. We believe the entire, not the entire, but as much as we were able to determine with regard to all of the six bidders was about 1.2 million. Uh, AEG had uh, seven lobbyists, that was the most that we had. These are the ones on record where they had anybody, people, any people behind the scenes who were whispering in, in the ears of uh, important people, we don't know. I mean, uh, you know, in terms of taxpayer dollars, they had all of these meetings, they used state resources, I'm sure, to conduct these meetings when they knew their staff was telling them that this was not a doable option. So your question is why? That was my, <laughs> that was our question, and I asked that at the press. Why? And the answer clearly, the answer clearly is political. This was not in the public interest, whether advance the uh, political agenda of the leaders, perhaps, all right? But there is no explanation justifying that uh, what proved to be a fiasco. I, I guess I was asking, how much money do you think the leaders wasted going down this um, aborted path? It's difficult to answer that because, for, because there are many components of that. One component is all of the amount, all of the time that was spent by professionals, the amount of time that they spent on a futile exercise. That was one. The other is the amount of money that the state could have gotten right up front at the beginning 
which they did not get. So all of these things, plus the, they had, in addition to the regular professional staff, they hired experts, other people to do, they had consultants, they had other people that were hired. So uh, I, I, we never sat down and, and added that up, but it's, it's, it's significant. Also, keep in mind, the money is, the money is so desperately needed. Uh, it was described, the state was described as hemorrhaging for money, and this is a, a description that was by a council uh, to the governor, uh, Peter Kiernan. But that description was, uh, was given by many other people who were looking at, at the uh, difficult state of affairs of, of New York. Could you characterize what the governor uh, may have said to you regarding his relationship with Peter Kiernan in this entire affair? Uh, I don't understand what I mean. heard from Ken Lovett of the Daily News that at the press conference, or somebody, I can't remember, maybe James Medor, that uh, Patterson said he was just listening to Kiernan. Well, all right. What, one of the criticisms that we made about the governor was the lack of direction. And he did say that the point man, the person who was supposed to be uh, dealing with, uh, with uh, this whole process on behalf of the chamber, was his counsel, Peter Cannon. And yes, he said when, uh, when he was examined that uh, he was listening to Cannon. Cannon, in a sense, was providing him with information as opposed, uh, uh, and, and direction as opposed to the governor giving Cannon direction. Um, we pointed out in the report that Kieran had some information which he did not share with the governor, and the question was why. So before Kieran briefed the governor, he briefed him on September 17th. By that time, they had already a Kieran already had a memo of September 8th from Budget, saying that AEG has financial problems. They also had as a memo September 17th, which went to the governor and to uh, the secretary Schwartz. And Kiernan was one of the ostensible authors of that. It had been prepared by other professionals, by his assistant counsel, and so on. In that report, it mentions deal with Wynn uh, and, and with, with uh, um, SL English. Nothing, don't waste your time. Then say waste your time, but don't bother with anybody else. And, and uh, these, people are, these people are not licensable. Kiernan briefs the governor does not tell him about AEG not being licensable, why? does not tell him why, we don't know why. But even though Kiernan does not tell him, when the, when the leaders meet, uh, Silver, who had been briefed very, very, very thoroughly by one of the assistants and the assembly staff, and knew, he knew from day one all of the problems. Um, and that's why one of the criticisms of Silver, he had all this information, all right? It may have been good politics to sit back and let them fight it out, and then at the end he puts conditions he imposes which cannot be met, which is an initial. The poison pill? Huh? Is that what he called it, the poison pill? There was no question. It was a, it was a poison pill, someone described it. And he said to us when he was examined, he knew these conditions were the equivalent of saying no. He could have said no, AEG is not good, we cannot meet, he's not, uh, does not satisfy what we need. Uh, Get rid of him. Said of that, he imposes four conditions he knows are impossible to meet. He knows that. He says this to us. All right. So why? You know what? What objective was he uh, advancing? In any event, what I getting back to your question at the meeting of the leaders, the first one, September 23rd. Even though Kiernan had not briefed the governor on the non-licensability uh, of uh, of AG, Samson raises it. And Kiernan is waiting outside, he's called in, and Samson says, give AEG more time to prove their licensability. Why? Why? It's not as if you've had, it's not as if they had the most attractive bid who had a minor problem, let him solve that problem. All right? Solve that problem, but then he had 12 other problems he'd have to solve and couldn't solve. So the timing of the report two weeks before the election, though, I'm sure that some Democrats are going to come out and say. Sure, and if I release a report after the election, the Republicans, Republicans would have said you're playing politics. Let me tell you, we had, this was an exhaustive investigation. 
we could not control the scheduling, the timing. Mm. We're interviewing the governor, we're interviewing the speaker, we're interviewing all of the people who are tied up uh, re uh, reasonably uh, with budget. And so we could not get them when we wanted to in terms of examinations. We went to Albany, they came to New York, there were uh, problems of attorneys being, and, and so this was when we were ready to release the report, okay? I'm not, let me just say, I'm not in the business, and my office is not in the business of impacting, influencing election. We are in the business, and this is our statutory requirement, of keeping the public informed of how its officials are behaving, and that's what we did.